<laughs> okay, so uh, let's start uh, this uh, PhD defense. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the jury members. So uh, I am uh, Yannick Priva, I will um, be the president of the jury. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Adam Wittek from the University of uh, Western Australia. Uh, Professor uh, Fabrice Jaillet from the University of Lyon. Uh, Professor uh, Oli Jacob Eli uh, from the um, uh, Oslo University Hospital. And uh, Stéphane Cotin, who is a research uh, director at ERIA. Okay, so uh, Jean Nicolas, it's up to you. You have uh, about uh, 50, um, around 50 or 40, 45 minutes. Uh, to make thank you. Perfect, thank you. All right, so thank you everyone for uh, assisting my defense uh, today. I will start, uh, well, let's first start with a quick overview of what I will be talking uh, today. So I will go through first the context of this research, the objective that we have set at the beginning of my thesis. Uh, we will then, I will then go through two different research directions. Uh, the first one was meshless methods, and then we'll go to immersed boundary methods. And then we'll see how we apply this to uh, non-rigid registrations. So let's start with the context. We are in a surgical context, more uh, specifically a liver surgery context. So. Uh, typically, before an operation, um, the uh, patients will go to the hospital. Uh, they will take uh, either a CT scan or an MRI scan. And this will give the medical teams uh, 3D images of uh, the liver of the patients. Now, during the surgery, uh, the surgeons will uh, surgeons will use these uh, preoperative images taken before the surgery, be, yeah, before the surgery, uh, and they will use this uh, to guide the actual operation. So this is a difficult step. Surgeons have to uh, mentally match what they are seeing uh, on the preoperative data or preoperative images and what they are currently seeing during the surgery. Uh, in, uh, in minimally invasive surgery, this is even worse as the abdomen of the patient is often uh, inflated by uh, gas. Uh, so uh, the, the liver is uh, undergoing large deformations, right? It is compressed by this gas. So what, what we would like to do is to uh, help the medical teams with this task um, by, by building a biomechanical model. So in a sense, it is a virtual representation of the liver of the patient. Uh, and we would like to deform this uh, virtual representation so that it match what the surgeons are currently seeing from the camera and overlay this virtual representations uh, in an augmented reality uh, a view. So in our cases for this thesis, we focused on the biomechanical model. Um, typically what we will uh, uh, try to solve is how do we compute the deformations of our virtual liver, uh, especially given a partial and very noisy inputs, uh, given a highly deformable material. So we will typically model the liver as an hyperelastic material. It should be uh, accurate enough for medical use and of course fast enough for interactive uh, applications. Uh, we should have the, this deformable models uh, live in live in real times during the operations. So this is where I get a little bit more technical. Uh, we are trying to solve the uh, Lagrangian um, Galarkin uh, formulations. So the idea here is to discretize um, the interior of our simulated domain. Um, and this discretization is what we will seek here in this thesis. It will give us a way to approximate here, U is my displacement field. So we are trying to approximate this uh, displacement for any point inside our initial domain. And we also need a way to integrate the elasticity equations um, uh, using this discretization. Now, uh, we would like to find such discretizations that is fast. So as I said, it should give us 
uh, the deformation of our virtual organ at least much faster than what the time it will take to retake a CT scan during uh, an operation. Um, it should be accurate enough because we are in um, a medical context. It should be simple enough. Uh, and this simplicity criterion here is uh, how how close are we to an almost automatic uh, discretization method? So we already have almost automatic uh, segmentation methods. It, it would be natural to try to uh, extend this to an almost automatic method that build this uh, biomechanical models without having a team of engineers coming for each new patient. So really, uh, uh, we would like to build uh, this, this model, this patient uh, specific models uh, as quick and as easily as possible. The stability criterion will be how uh, robust our simulations is to large and un unexpected forces and especially non-physical inputs. Uh, as we have seen, we will uh, have some, um, some data from the laparoscopic camera during the, the, the operation. This can, can give uh, really noisy uh, inputs to our simulation. So our method should remain stable to those kind of inputs. So the, tradi the, the traditional way is probably the finite element methods, which consists of discretizing the organ with uh, using this geometrical element. These are probably the most popular. So we have the triadrons and hexahedral elements uh, of different order of approximation or interpolations. As we go right here, on the screen, uh, we will reach higher convergence rate. So if possible, we should go with higher degrees elements as it will converge to the solution using less or fewer elements. Now the problem is if we look at these two here first, uh, the hexahedral element, if we try to automatically mesh a domain, so in this case it is a cylinder attached to a wall, as we become more and more strict on following the boundaries at some point we have no, no, uh, no other way but using tetrahedral elements um, in some region of the domain. Uh, here they are in red and the hexahedral are in gray. If we are not doing this then we have very distorted uh, or very stretch out elements, which will result in um, instabilities or numerical issues. This is even more difficult when we have to mesh this. So this is a half part of a liver. Um, if we are trying to do this, again, uh, almost automatically, so using a mesher software or some things, um, the, these kind of software we will gen generally prefer uh, tetrahedral, um, especially linear tetrahedral elements. But even then, if we come back to this, automatic measures will usually generate uh, too much elements to really follow the boundaries of uh, the internal vessels or the uh, boundaries of the liver itself, uh, or it will generate badly formed elements, or uh, it will simply not respect boundaries, uh, which will result in the lack in, of accuracy. So it is always uh, a balance between accuracy and speed, uh, and, and finding this balance is uh, difficult, so it, it, uh, it goes against our simplicity criterion. So automatically meshing uh, these uh, difficult, um, uh, these difficult um, domains uh, while respecting our four criteria is very difficult by using a mesh of elements. So the first thing we, we, we said at the beginning of this thesis is it will be therefore natural to seek a discretization or an alternative discretization method that is, well, without elements. So that was our first uh, direction of research, meshless methods. Now the first thing, um, the first thing you, uh, um, you hit when you start to look for meshless methods is there are many of them. <laughs> and now most of them are small variations of the others. Some are more um, targeted for fluid simulation, others for elastic or viscoelastic simulations, some are for, more for computer graphics, or others are more for, for uh, mechanical uh, engineering problems. So in our cases, uh, as I said before, we want to stay in the Galarkian Lagrangian variational formulation so that we stay close to what we were doing with standard finite element methods. So 
if we if we focus on these uh, formulations, we actually have chosen two different uh, methods. The first one is called point-based animation methods, and the second one, Malambi, so meshless approximation, mesh-based integration. So the 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 idea here is this uh, green circle is my liver. So it uh, let's suppose it represents our simulated object. It will be uh, easier like that. If I fill it with nodes, so in this case, the, the, the nodes represent are, are the equivalent uh, equivalence of the nodes of the finite element methods. So uh, in this case, we often call them particles, and they represent the degrees of freedom of our system to, sol to be solved. Now, uh, we will use those particles to approximate the displacement field um, at any point inside the, the green circle, right? And we will do so by using the displacement value at the neighbor, neighborhood uh, particles. Neighboring par particles, sorry. Um, and this little guy here is called the shape function, and it will be what will determine uh, how to approximate the displacement fields, and we have to actually build it. Right? Um, for the MLAMB methods, we also had uh, another step. We put here a background mesh of regular elements, in this case, hexahedral elements. We remove every element that are lying completely outside the domain, uh, and this will be our integration grid. So again, we, we, we want to uh, approximate the displacement field, but also integrate the elasticity equations. So. Let's start with that. Uh, for the PBA, we have implemented two shape functions. The first one, SPH, our smoothed particle hydrodynamics formulations. It is using an approximation of a volume of a particles, especially of a density of a particles, uh, and then using a weight or a kernel function, W here. It will decrease the influence of a particle as you get far from it. Uh, the second one was the moving least square or MLS uh, formulations, which tried to build uh, an approximation function using basis functions. Now, this one is a little bit more interesting because it allows us to get uh, shape functions uh, a little bit more rich because we can add different basis functions. In this case, these are monomials of different degrees, so we can have shape functions of higher degrees, similarly to what we would have with finite elements. We could go with hexahedral elements of different degrees of approximation, so this is uh, about equivalent. Um, so we will then find the uh, coefficients here, A, that minimize the approximation error of those basis function. For the integration of the PBA methods, we use an SPH, again, the SPS formulation of the volume to really grossly approximate the integral over these particles. This is a point-based integration scheme. Um, and finally, for the MLAMB, we have tried uh, with the same MLS formulations for the shape functions, but using uh, the gauss quadrature scheme of this background mesh. So in this case, the integration is done the same way as with standard finite elements. The difference here is for each integration point, we use the point cloud of particle to approximate the displacement. We also proposed a meshless co-rotational approach, which is, uh, which is the uh, equivalent uh, of the finite element co-rotational approach. So in this case, instead of using hyperelasticity, which is nonlinear, we use linear elasticity. So by linear, linearizing the strain tensor E here, uh, we can only represent small uh, transformation. That means that if we rotate our organ or our simulated object without deforming it, it will see these rotation as actual strain or deformations and it will produce wrong elastic force. So the idea here is to wrap our stiffness matrix K, which is constant since we are using linear elasticity, and it's, it's to wrap it um, with a rotation matrix, which is actually the rotation of each nodes now, how can we get these rotations from point clouds? Uh, we took the idea from Matthias Muller, which proposed a way to extract uh, a transformation matrix uh, from point clouds using the distance between each node and their center of mass. 
Uh, here, instead of using the center of mass, we use a particle itself. So uh, for PBA, it is like the integration points are both the approximation points. So for a particle, the distance between a particle and its closest neighbors uh, times this distance in the undeformed um, shape, then we have our transformation matrix. And using a singular value decompositions, uh, we extract the rotation matrix from these transformations, and we have our wrapping matrix. So we've tried this with a couple of different uh, scenarios. Uh, we've stretched some beams with uh, gravity. I'm not sure if you're seeing. Yeah. Uh, you sh so yeah, at the center, it's uh, 3D beams that is stretched out by the gravity. We've tried cutting applications. We've tried collisions. We've tried uh, simulating different uh, elastic materials. Uh, in the center here, it's SPH, again, corrotated SPH against uh, FM. We have the same thing with MLS, so the PBA approach. Um, so it, it gives a good visual result. Uh, we also tried the bending, so the corrotated elasticity with the MLAM B methods. Here we have a beam, rectangular beams attached to one hand and having some traction on the other end. Uh, here the graph is the number of nodes against the distance from a reference solutions, uh, FM reference solutions. We, have, we, we take the distance from a point in the middle of the beam. So in blue, we have FM, and in um, orange, we have our corrotated MLAMB. So it was great at that time to see that we are converging about to the same solutions, uh, a little bit faster in this case. So these were uh, good results. Um, in, in the, for, for, for our kind of application, it was clear for us that the MLAMB methods was probably the most accurate. When we look for PBA methods in the literature, we usually see that they are aimed for uh, computer graphics applications uh, and for animations, which seek more uh, visually plausible simulation than accurate one. So here, the MLAMB using both the richer MLS formulation and the Gauss quadrature was giving us um, uh, more accurate results. Now, at that point, we uh, took a big decision. We decided to uh, change or to try a different approach. So uh, when we look at our four criteria here, there was one with mesh test methods that we never actually succeeded to make work. To, to, to make work. It's the simplicity criterion. Now, um, this, this was a little bit of a surprise because for us, at first at least, it's, it sounded really appealing, you know, just simply feeling uh, the object with points and starting the simulations for us, the simplicity was respected. Where in fact we found out that it's not that simple. Um, there's a lot of parameters. First, finding the good kernel or weight functions, determining the distance of influence uh, for each particle, so how far a particle should be from the integration cell. Uh, what's the good density of particle? How many particles should impact a, an, an integration cell in this case? Uh, what's the density of integration points? So uh, uh, how, how fine, or what's the size of this background mesh, this optimal size, and if we refine the integration uh, grid, uh, how do we adapt the amount of particles on the, on the other end? So it's always, uh, if we play with one parameter, do we have to adapt the other one? Um, and also the location of particles. Should we put a large amount of particle around the boundaries uh, as we are doing with FM? Um, so, and also, yeah, the integration over the boundaries, these background mesh, they are actually not respecting the boundaries, right? They are cut by the particles, so by the boundaries of the objects. How do we deal with that? Now, for us, all these questions or parameters was kind of bringing us with our initial problems with standard uh, finite element methods, which is we need to mesh. Now, in this case, uh, we, we are not meshing, but it, is, it, it does seem a little bit like it, right? So we reevaluated our objective. We, we, very, we really liked the idea of putting a background mesh. Uh, it is simple to do. You just put a grid in this case, and uh, ta-da. So could we do the same with uh, by placing the nodes uh, directly on the corners of the elements? So in this case, we come back to the finite element methods, but 
we are allowing the boundaries to be immersed or embed inside this background grid. So in this case, these steps are simply embed the simulation, the simulated domain inside the finite element grid, treat every full cells, so the, the elements that are lying completely inside the domain, treat them as standard finite element method, and concentrate or handle the elements that are cut by the boundary. And in this case, this is the new numerical challenge, right? We need to find a way to, uh, to deal with those uh, elements. Now, embedding um, a simulated domain or embedding the, some boundaries inside a finite element mesh is a concept called immersed boundary methods um, or fictitious uh, domain methods. There are uh, different names, uh, and, and it's a whole uh, research uh, branch, actually. So. We, we, we started uh, looking in these directions. Now, the first things uh, when you, 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 you use this kind of methods is you now have the choice of any elements you want. You can choose any elements you would like to have on your uh, simulations because, of course, you are not uh, required to really respect the boundaries of the simulated demands. So in this case, which one should we take? The tridual elements or, the, or uh, exhydral elements? Well, we are not the first that ask this question. It's been a debate for quite some time now. We found a couple of uh, citations, uh, especially for uh, uh, elastic materials or uh, biological simulations. They were pretty much all saying the same, time, same thing. So exhydral meshes, uh, usually require four to ten times fewer elements uh, to converge to the same solutions than tetrahedral mesh. Tetrahedral elements, especially linear ones, are predisposed to locking artifacts when used uh, with uh, highly incompressible materials. Uh, some will even say linear tetrahedral elements should almost always be avoided. <laughs> um, others that when biological structures are modeled, we should use exhydral elements when possible. So for us, the choice was clear. We went with exhydral. But not only exhydral elements, we went with a background grid of regular exhydral elements, right? We only put a grid of uh, rectangular cells uh, as our mesh. So this brings uh, a, couple of, a couple more of advantages. First, uh, we got good numerical properties from the regular uh, parallel epiped, so regular exhydral. Uh, we also have uh, an extension to nat na uh, natural extensions to demand decomposition so geometrical multigrid solvers. Uh, there's a direct construction for medical images, if you want, that uses voxels, and it is also very well adapted for an automatic workflow, the, the, the simplicity criteria that we had at the beginning. It is easy to simply put a mesh and refine it if you want more accuracy, etc. So Again, uh, using immersed or EBM methods, using a background grid, uh, we are not the first one to do it. Uh, it has been studied a lot in computational mechanics applications, uh, not so much in uh, liver surgery or uh, highly elastic uh, simulations. So the three main questions that they will usually try to answer is how do we integrate over cut cells? So how do we avoid this red region here that is not actually simulated? Uh, how do we prescribe displacement, so uh, directly boundary conditions? And how do we apply boundary forces such as pressure and tractions, so uh, Newman boundary conditions? Now let's start with the integrations. If we zoom on this cut element here, uh, and I swap back. So here is a view with our four, uh, four quadrature nodes, so using the um, Gauss quadrature scheme. The typical way to integrate uh, a field value, a function over these elements, is to sum the value of a first integration node times a certain weight, plus the value at a second node, and third, and the fourth node. And this gives us an approximation of the integrations, right? So when we look at this, there there is these three integration points that are lying completely outside the simulated domain. So they are representing regions that should not be simulated. 
So what could we do to improve this? Well, the first thing we could try is to split the elements into smaller subcells. Uh, now, in this case, it is tricky. We are still keeping our initial elements uh, for the degrees of freedom, so it still have four nodes, but the subcells are only used for the integrations, right? So we are only adding integration points inside of the elements. We can remove the subcells that are completely outside and do this for a second subdivision and then a third and now we have a lot of integration points around the uh, locations that we really want to simulate um, and so this is uh, the basis of a well-known methods called finite cell method uh, now the these finite cell methods are not only uh, targeting the integration scheme, but also the displacement prescription and uh, Newman boundary conditions. So if we start with the uh, um, Dirichlet boundary conditions, there are usually three methods, uh, Lagrange multipliers, niche methods, and the penalty methods. Now, the first two are a little bit more stricter, which means that they will try to prescribe more accurately the displacements, and the penalty will be a forces. Now, which one should we choose for our kind of application? So if we go back to the beginning um, and we look at what we have or what we want to simulate, we have this biomechanical model built from our preoperative data. And we have this intraoperative data, which is a very noisy and incomplete reconstruction of the part of the liver that is visible from the laparoscopic camera. So even sometimes it will reconstruct parts around the liver that are not uh, actually deliver. So these are very noisy input data. So uh, for us, it will make no sense to go with a very strict uh, imposition method because we will try to deform the organs so that it match unphysical uh, inputs, right? It will try to deform to match parts around the liver and so on. So we, we decided to choose uh, the penalty because, well, first it is very simple to implement, uh, but it also gives us this uh, this uh, possibility to uh, uh, play with this penalty factor. Uh, so in this case, the penalty method is handled with forces, which is exactly the same as uh, Newman conditions. So we handle these two cases uh, using the same numerical scheme. Uh, if this is my cut cells, uh, and in blue we have the boundaries, which is tessellated, so it is meshed with triangles, um, the, we, we will typically apply the forces on the nodes of our surface triangles here, uh, which will fill up a surface nodal vector uh, at the right end in blue. And the idea is to build a mapping matrix that will propagate these forces to the, the nodes of of my background element. Now, for the mapping matrix, we used the shape value or the shape function value of uh, the surface, a surface node uh, with respect to one of the nodes of the background element. So this gives us as a sub matrix, um, three by three sub matrix. And at the end, this mapping matrix will be very sparse and can be pre-computed before the simulations. So uh, this operation here is highly uh, efficient. Now we've tried a preliminary validation on simple scenario first, uh, a typical uh, uh, cylinder, cylindrical beams that is attached to one end and have attraction uh, on the other end. And again, a cylinders that now n do not have pressure attraction but have displacement in positions uh, so that it stretch out to about three times its original length. So let's start with the bending uh, cylinders. Uh, in blue here, so first at the bottom we have the number of nodes against um, the relative displacements error of a finite element solutions using uh, quadratic tetrahedral elements. So that's our solutions. So uh, in in um, uh, so in green here we have linear tetrahedral meshes simulations, and in blue it's what we call a sparse grid. So it's uh, it's a background mesh, but where we are doing absolutely nothing uh, for the cut elements. So it gives these oscillations because sometimes as we refine the, the, the grid, it will align with the actual simulated domain. So it will create these oscillations. So if we add one level of subdivisions of our finite cell methods, 
it does improve a lot the oscillations uh, and it gets closer to the tetrahedral simulations with now two level of subdivisions and then three we have a very uh, a very smooth curve and a very high um, a convergence rate so it is that was actually one of the first results we had. Uh, we were very happy with this. Um, however, if we look now at the time it takes to build this stiffness matrix, so again, since we are using now nonlinear elasticity, we have to build this matrix a lot of time for each simulation step. So uh, again, at the bottom here, we have the tetrahedral simulations against sparse grids, which is simply hexahedral mesh without anything more. Uh, if we have one level of subdivisions, it is a little bit slower, two level, and then three level, it goes exponentially. So, uh, of course, th this is a problem for us. We, we want something that is interactive or almost interactive. Uh, now, if we look back at how the cell is uh, handled, it's, it's obviously the amount of integration points here. There is numerical operation that goes for each of these integration points. It's way, way too slow. Sometimes we had actually, more, uh, it was taking more time to build the stiffness matrix than to solve the system itself. So obviously we could not go uh, that way. We have to keep the original integration points. Uh, um, and so, we figured, well, how how could we do this? Um, so, yeah, we decided to still use this subdivision grids, but now instead of using it to adding more integration points, we kept the original four integration points uh, in this case and used these subdivisions to weight down the influence of each particles that are outside uh, or cut by the boundary. Now, if we take back our equations here, uh, we have um, now the first integration point or Gauss point here is completely removed because it is lying inside an empty region. The second and third terms, uh, actually the rest of the terms are weighed down by this approximation of the volume of each fourth of this element. So, uh, for example, the green one is about half of the influence uh, of its full um, uh, integration points when they are full. Uh, the blue one is completely lying inside, so it is the usual weight. And again, this one is about half its volume, so it will have less influence. So we call this the weighted cell. Um, and we've tried it. So this is our previous result with the finite cell methods. Now, if I add the weighted cell for one subdivision, we can see that it is, uh, so the, the same color is the same amount of uh, subdivision. So it is about the same result as the finite cells, which is a, a very, actually, actually was very surprising, and we we're very happy at the first with that. Uh, now two subdivisions and three subdivisions, it stays quite close to the finite cell methods, right? And it does smooth out these oscillations and get better uh, or higher convergence. Now, the very, very nice thing with this is if we go back to the time taken for the assembly, if I add now the three level of subdivisions, you probably haven't seen anything change, right? That's because they are all stacked up at the bottom. Of course, they are taking exactly the same time as standard finite element method. We didn't actually add any, any operation or numerical operation. We only weighted down the weight of each integration point. Now, this is very uh, interesting because we can reuse optimal finite element code or software that are highly, highly optimized uh, and that have been optimized for the past uh, decades. So this is, um, this is a very strong point for us. We also tried with, again, the stretching scenario, which induces or introduce a large amount of deformations very fast. We got even better results in this case. So all in all, these preliminary, preliminary validation scenario were quite uh, good. Uh, and the next step was obviously to go with a little bit more complex scenario. So we figured if we go with a complex scenario, let's go directly to simulating a liver, right? That's the end goal, so let's do this. So we embedded um, the surface of a liver inside weighted uh, cell immersed boundary grids. Um, 
to test this out. So we were quite lucky. We had some data from uh, Oslo and the Oslo University Hospital um, of three uh, pig livers. So here in blue, we have CT scans uh, from uh, here. It's the side view and the bottom view of the liver for each of our three uh, um, pig. Uh, and in red, we have the intraoperative one after inserting uh, gas into the abdomen of the pig, so pneumo peritoneum. Uh, so in this case, we can see, for example, for the trial one, the bottom view, we can see the amount of deformations that um, that have received the, the pig liver here just simply by the gas. So these are good candidates for testing our methods. So what we did is we used them inside this validation pipeline um, where uh, at the top here we have the pre-op uh, CT scan reconstruction that Im we immersed into a very, very fine grid or immersed boundary grid and we do an iterative closest point registrations towards the intra-op CT surface. Now the ICP registrations here is <coughs> Uh, goes as follow. If we have the, the targets, which is the intra-op surface, we find the closest neighbor surface to surface. We deform the organs. We then recompute again the closest neighbors from the, our biomechanical model and the targets, deform again until it matches the whole surface. Now, once we have done this with the very fine grids, the solutions or the, the displacement field solutions here was tagged as our kind of manufactured solution. So this allows us to get a displacement fields that we can impose for different grid size here at the left. So these are our test grids. And on the right, we have the solutions of such imposition, displacement impositions. That's the embed surface, and that's the deformed grid. So we can see how bad they look. But if we look at the surface, it's actually very impressing. For, for this one, I mean, it's a super coarse grid, and it gives yet good uh, surface deformations, which is uh, very good. If we look at the graphs now, again, this is the L2 displacement or relative displacements error against these manufactured solutions. We have in blue our weighted cell methods and in orange the tetrahedral uh, simulations. Now it is important to note here for the tetrahedral one, we actually meshed the, the, the organs with different number of nodes. Um, and we can see that we were actually not able to go with fewer nodes than this one here uh, without actually generating a badly formed element or without uh, respecting the boundaries of the liver. So it shows how difficult it can be to mesh um, a liver uh, and, and, and how we can have very, very uh, coarse grids with our Method. So this is uh, very interesting. Um, so yeah, we can see the results are quite good here. They are almost, uh, normally what we have observed is they are at worst similar to finite element methods, uh, tetrahedral ones, but usually uh, they converge a little bit faster. This is the mean displacements error on every surface node um, for all three trial. Um, and so yeah. For us, it was clear that uh, our four criteria uh, were, were respected, uh, at least for this initial trial or in initial validation schemes. So we were very satisfied with that. The next step was to bring this on real case uh, um, validation scenario, so application to non-rigid registrations. So again, I, I present here the pig trials, but we also had some data from human ex vivo livers on the right. So again, in blue, we have the pre-op CT scan. In red, the intra-op, so after the deformations. And we have here, uh, completely at the bottom for the pig, it's the 3D partial reconstruction from the laparoscopic stereo camera. Now, these will, will be used to deform our models, to match it, our validation, which is the intra-op CT scan here. For the human trial, it was ex vivo, so it was simply a, a human liver lying, so it, uh, lying on the tables. Uh, we took a first CT scan, labeled it as our pre-op CT or our pre-op domain. We then put something underneath, generating a first 
deformations, that was our trial number one, and then do the same with another deformation, that was our trial number two. In this case, we use an RGBD camera, so a camera that gives us depth informations to build this point cloud, uh, this intra-app um, information that we will be applying to our, uh, our model. So the validation workflow goes like this. We embedded the surface inside a weighted cell IBM method. We did a non-rigid ICP again, but this time using the intra-partial reconstruction, right? So this gave us a deformation field, which we can use to compute the actual positions or deformed positions of the internal structures. For the pig, it was vessels. So we use vessel bifurcations as markers, validation markers. For the human trial, it was uh, artificial markers, so it was uh, we physically inserted some balls inside the organs uh, before and after the deformations. So if we look at the uh, results um, for the pig and human, so you have uh, in millimeters the mean, the median, the min, the max, and the standard deviations. And the rigid registrations is simply moving the liver so that it match the uh, point cloud, so without any deformation. So if you look at this and you are telling yourself, well, region looks better, <laughs> yeah, this is this was our first impressions. Why does rigid registration is actually better than non-rigid uh, for the pig trials? And the human is actually a bit better, uh, so the, the, the deformations was giving us better results. So what happened? What actually happened here? Well, if we look at the visual output, we can see that both of them are not doing really great. Um, it, it, it's actually, it looks like we are missing boundary informations, right? We are not restricting enough our uh, deformations uh, such that it goes gives better results. Uh, for the human trial, probably that the RGBD camera was giving us more uh, more information, which lead to better uh, solutions. So, uh, yeah, sorry, here in blue, it's the, uh, the uh, preoperative uh, undeformed organ. In, in red, it's the validation, so the intra CT. And in green, it's our deformable model. So these errors could come from uh, different things. Uh, first, incorrect partial surface reconstructions, right? Uh, it could be missing too much information, so boundary conditions on the back of the liver. It could be the material, the simulated material, so anisotropy or incompressibility. It could be also the lack of heterogeneity, modeling the vessels or the Gibson capsule. So. Uh, at least to try to remove the first two from the equations, we redid our validation workflow, but this time, instead of the intra-partial reconstruction here, we use directly the intra-op CT scan. So this is uh, about the same as if we were reconstructing perfectly the whole surface of the organ. Uh, so we've tried that, uh, we got much better result. Um, uh, so for both the, the pig and the human trials. Uh, now we still have uh, almost two centimeters for the trial two uh, for the pig simulations uh, with a maximum of uh, almost three, uh, almost four centimeters here. So it's, uh, these are still uh, big errors. So uh, where, where, where are they coming from, right? If we look again at the visual output, in red we have the uh, um, deep intra up CT scan, and in light green it's our deformable model. So they, they are actually aligning perfectly for this, from the surface point of view. So our method did great here. Uh, the, the surface, uh, actually our, um, uh, our non-rigid uh, ICP method finished its job, so the surface is correctly aligning to the intra up one. If we look inside, however, um, we can see that the markers are still a little bit far from each other. Some of them are closer, some of them are a little bit farther from each other. So the line here represents uh, the connection between uh, a deformed or a simulated markers and the actual positions in the CT scan. Um, so yeah, it remains some errors here, even if we have a perfect reconstruction of the surface.
So again, these two sources of inaccuracies come from intra and preoperative data processing, right? The segmentation of the pre-op liver uh, or the reconstruction, uh, the 3D reconstruction from uh, the camera during the uh, operation. So these two, we, we do not ha actually have a lot of control over them. The last two, however, are the biomechanical model, right? The material and the lack of heterogeneity. This is our model. But when you look at this, none of them are related to the discretization methods. Uh, so it is not related to the, fin the weighted cell methods or the IBM methods. We have exactly the same thing with finite element methods. So it is unrelated to, to the discretizations. Um, but, however, if we look at uh, those two here, we could use uh, an immersed boundary methods to actually uh, help modeling um, uh, heterogeneity, for example, or uh, uh, anisotropy on some part of the uh, of the liver. So, these will be our next research directions. Um, investigate first the impact of heterogeneity and the choice of material on the result of these uh, simulations. Uh, we found that there's really not a large amount of, um, uh, of research done using uh, pre-op and intra-op data uh, to validate the simulation. So uh, we think it would be a very good uh, direction to go at least get some data to validate the different uh, model and the impact of heterogeneity. Also determining a good validation matrix we use markers, right? But if we remove two, for example, of these markers, the worst one, our score will be much higher. So we could actually choose which one to put. For, for us, it is difficult to validate the results that we have. Some markers were really good, others were not. So what should we use as a matrix when, you, when we use these pre-op and intra-op data? And finally, as I said, using the EBM method, IBM method to model, model homogeneity, um, to model different material. If they are uh, the same materials but with different stiffness, it comes for homogenizations. Uh, if we could also simulate different kind of material using constraint simulation, so these are probably the, for the, the next steps we will take uh, for our research. So this ends my presentations. I just want to um, say, well, first, hello for the HyperNav team. So I was part uh, of the uh, European project called HyperNav, uh, where uh, 16 PhD students work together uh, toward improving the navigation of soft tissues. Uh, and we work from different places in Europe. Um, so this thesis uh, was made possible because of this. Oh, yeah, and thank you, uh, thank you all. Um, I think I will uh, let the president now take the lead. So. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. So thank you. Uh, we will now switch to the question and comments uh, session, and uh, I propose to start with the reviewers. Um, so Professor Wittock. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it's a bit noisy. Okay. Uh, I have a few questions. You can bring perhaps slides. Slide seven. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Guys, uh, uh, could you please take the Thanks. Go ahead, Adam. Yeah. So this uh, a quick uh, must be quickly available and. Uh, uh, the real deformation, as close as possible, the real deformation of the liver. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, so uh, yeah. accuracy. So, when you think about image guided surgery, the accuracy is limited by the resolution of the image. Uh, yeah. 
So that means that uh, f uh, when you compare it to engineering, uh, let's say, solution, the accuracy requirement actually much less stringent than you would, for instance, need to have when you want to design all the, the turbine of the jet engine, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and again, and then simplicity, I, I, I couldn't understand what you actually mean by this. So, because the method algorithm can be actually very complex, but can be sort of easy, uh, can uh, can be easy to use from the user perspective, right? So, so I, I'm not sure what, what you mean here. Okay. So, the, so the, well, I will first, yeah. So when you compare with... meshless method to finite element, definitely finite elements are more simple from the perspective of the algorithm, right? So that... Yeah, yeah there, there's that also. Okay, so first for the accuracy, I mean, uh, don't cite me on that, but I remember hearing from uh, someone that less than five millimeters error could actually come from the uh, segmentation from the medical yeah. images. So of course there's, there's an error here, but for us, it's actually the best that we will have during an, uh, during an operations, right? The best thing you could have to locate these tumors is to uh, bring back, bring a, bring a CT scan or some advanced operation room will have those kind of scans and retake a CT. So for us, this is, the, the, the best we can do, and this is our validation mark. Of course, we could go higher than that, like in engineering problems, but for us, at least if we can get as close as what would give a CT scan taken during the surgery, it, this is obviously very good. And we also need to remember the first initial uh, difficulties for, for the surgeons, it was to do this mental uh, match between the pre-op images they are seeing and the, uh, the, what they are seeing from the camera, right? And if we at least can help them to move uh, so, so that they don't have to do this mentally to move the pre-op uh, images to what they are seeing, if we can help them for that, it is already a huge win for us. So, uh, of course, we can go very far for reaching a lot of accuracy, but at the end, the surgeons will, I think they, they will prefer, the first thing they will prefer is to uh, to have this mentally mental difficulty removed from our, their work uh, their workflow. Now, for the simplicity criterion, again, uh, we will have different uh, different levers from one patient to another. Uh, Sometimes it is impressive how much uh, uh, different shapes they can have. So the idea of simplicity is we should not have to spend a huge amount of time creating and generating these discretizations of our virtual organs, right? We could not... Uh, we, we could not uh, ask an engineer teams uh, or a team of engineers to come each time before the operation so that they set up the mesh or the mesh test discretizations and all the, these parameters. So for us, the, simpli the simplicity was, well, how, how accurate can a medical teams get if they are themselves setting the simulations and do not spend too much time to set it? And the simplicity comes from this. So how, how close to automatic discretization we can get without any help. And this, in the case of IBM, we like that because it removed completely the parameters um, uh, uh, argument. So you, so you don't have a lot of things to, par to parameterize to make the simulation work. However, you transfer the difficulty to the computation itself or to the methods or to how to, do we end all these cut boundaries. So it, is, it might be a little bit complex for us, uh, a little bit more complex for us, but it is simpler for the end user, which will be medical teams. So then we look at slide, I think 25, it talks about different integration methods. 25. Mm. Yeah, I think it, this is different. Yeah. This one? Okay. Yeah, so this, uh, I couldn't understand, so in this point-based animation, so you are doing integration, uh, so-called nodal integration here, or what does it really mean? Yeah, I uh, just, I think it was uh, this one, right? 
So the SPH okay. formulations for the uh, not all uh, not all base integration. Okay, so, but there are there are many nodal integration schemes which are commercially implemented. For instance, and less Dyna software, and they appear to be quite quite robust. Some people say maybe more robust than the so-called background-based integration. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean that was the first one we actually tried uh, the SPH formulations to uh, integrate. We actually followed this lead because it was used for highly interactive simulations, so for uh, for animations and things like that. Um, and we need to remember this speed criterion, right? We cannot, uh, like like uh, what we have uh, seen with the adding more integration points and what uh, and so on, we cannot actually have a, a method that will be very very slow to compute the stiffness matrix because we we need to do this many times, especially if we want to model nonlinear materials. We need to compute this very uh, very often, and this is even worse if we want to cut at some point uh, the argon. Uh, so uh, I'm pretty sure, yeah, there the, the must exist a lot of better way to integrate uh, the elasticity equations. It's always finding this, this, this good balance, right, between the accuracy and the speed and then the simplicity. So for us, yeah, in that, I mean, this was actually a good choice because it was the simpler one for us and it was the sample to set up, so which means we were already in the good directions for the simplicity criterion. Now, obviously, uh, like I said at the end, the PBA methods should probably not be used for surgical applications because at the end, the accuracy was really not there. Uh, it was giving uh, visually uh, good results, but uh, not really uh, accurate one. Then you have this presentation about Lagrange slide about Lagrange multipliers uh, and so on. Well, what is it about actually? It's about, uh, imposing, the, um, the essential, it's about imposing essential boundary conditions. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's yeah. for boundary condition. Uh, yeah, okay, this one. but there is yeah, okay, but there is whole family of this so-called interpolating moving least square method. Yeah. That actually totally eliminate the need for for uh, the Lagrange multipliers, Nietzsche method, penalty, and so on, because they you... add also computational cost, and probably they are not. Yeah, that, that's the one may, using the. Uh, that's the one using the explicit time integration scheme, right? It's a sort of penalties that uh, depends on the time steps that you have chosen or the. Uh, no, 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 no. There are there's just whole family of the okay. uh, so-called interpolating moving least square method. They simply uh, they 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 they, I, they they are almost interpolating. So that means that this uh, pres uh, prescribing of essential boundary conditions is uh, is quite. I okay. think you wouldn't find it here because it's simply no. Yeah. This simply. It's ordinary element free Galerkin method, element free Galerkin method, but simply with a slight modification of the moving okay. release. Oh, that's really interesting. Uh, yeah, and this is from 1997, I think, or something like this. <laughs> but it was for meshless. Yeah, 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 it's for meshless. Yeah. But I, mean, I guess we, yeah, we could probably the, use it for. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, I guess we could also use it for immersed boundary methods. Uh, they are very close. I mean, when you think about it, meshless methods are kind of uh, uh, immersed boundary methods because we are embedding the simulation domain into point clouds. So that's why also we'll often see these Lagrange multiplier and niche also for uh, okay. yeah. for uh, meshless. In this methods. case, yes, yes. In this yeah. case, yes. That's correct. Yeah. So that, then, that would uh, be very good. Uh, yeah. Another question. We often uh, use several times this beam for verification. Yeah. And I know that it's, that it's widely used in the literature. I just don't see connection with that, uh, let's say, liver deformation, for instance. 
Yeah, let's see. Now, these are always for preliminary validations. At least, you know, first make sure the we actually implemented correctly. <laughs> uh, with meshes method, the, this was a huge problem. Each time we had an actual, uh, the, uh, I mean, a wrong result or something going on, it, it was always difficult to see if it was our implementation or the actual methods because these methods are actually. Uh, usually not implemented in most uh, simulation software or at least uh, open source one. So for Meshless and IBM, we actually had to implement a lot of them. Now these scenarios, they have this advantage. Uh, you can test rapidly if your algorithm is okay. It also uh, brings another advantage is that as we can see, the beam is fixed. Uh, on one part that is exactly aligned from both the grid and the cylinder. So we kind of remove a little bit the, um, the uh, directly boundary conditions uh, part of the validations on this part. So in the left part with the beam, the bented beam, it's only really the integrations that come into play. Uh, for the right one, for the stretching one then, here we are really imposing displacement so we can see uh, how far or how accurate we can get. But still, these are preliminary validations. So the usual next step is try it with uh, difficult or more complex surface or, uh, or object. And that was our second step. It was using directly liver uh, for our simulated objects. Because livers, I mean, the, the surface of the livers are quite complex. They change, like I said, a lot between the different patients. So these are good, uh, th these were good candidates for validating. So that's why we use them for the second part of the validation. Yeah. I think you mix two things, verification and validation. So I have no problem with using simple shapes, simply the choice of the example. For instance, instead of beam bending, you can have a you know, compression of the cylinder, indentation of the cylinder, which seem to be more closer, more close to the, uh, so closer to the, to the, uh, yeah. let's say, problem of organ deformation. I noticed one more thing in this slide. So you use you now Hukian material model, which is, uh, uh, well, hyperastic material model and essentially developed for almost or nearly incompressible materials use Poisson ratio of 0 0.3. Yeah, we use this like for steel, which is like for steel rather than for rubber. So why 0 0.3, not for instance 0 0.49? Because we wanted to compare with um, an equivalent degrees, uh, no, so using finite element uh, methods, using tetrahedral elements. And in these cases, okay. uh, to get the same degrees, yeah. because we yeah. haven't went higher, yeah, I guess you get the point, with highly incompressible, yeah. you got locking. Yeah, yeah. So I understand. Yes, yeah. you will have locking, so that's, uh, that's not, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's all, all questions I have. Okay. Uh, except maybe we can go to conclusions one the yeah. conclusion one of the last slides. So the, the, the next research directions are, are before uh, this yeah, one? Actually this one, yes, uh, this uh, heterogeneous model. Yeah. So you, you are essentially looking at the, so you are computing the formation field within the continuum by describing the, uh, by, uh, by imposing loading through describing the displacement sound of the bond line. So that should not be very, the result should not be very sensitive to this heterogeneity. I think uh, uh, if you can, of course, that, that will be the difference, but certainly not within this uh, uh, accuracy you mentioned, like uh, 5 or 10 millimeters. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think this probably may not be even needed. Um, okay. Because for us, you know, when you have only the partial surface, then oh, okay. I guess it becomes more um, uh, more important. Uh, but even you okay. know, when 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 we use the whole surface, uh, then yeah, maybe it was not the heterogeneity in this case. It could be the incompressibility. Uh, we actually have quite different results when we play. 
I, I think definitely, definitely. So more, I think more, li more, more likely in compatibility than this uh, heterogeneity. But, yeah. but, okay. That, okay. Yeah. I, I mean, you. that's the. That's why it's uh, for our re the next research. For us, I, for me, it's it's, uh, it's something that I really want to uh, answer. You know, where where are these uh, error or remaining remaining errors coming from? So uh, and that's why I think it would be super interesting to uh, is it the heterogeneity or this uh, incompressibility and things like that. And uh, I think if it is the uh, one of these two, the IDM methods could be a good candidate here. So yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I have I have no more questions. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, no. Uh, Professor Vitek, uh, yeah. if you're okay, uh, you're, you're not. Uh, you don't have to to stay and hear the other question as you want. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I would be happy not to stay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's been quite late. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, you're good welcome. luck. Uh, good luck. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, Professor Jaillet? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you for inviting me to review uh, this work and to be part of this uh, committee. I'm very, very glad to be with you. I would have preferred to enjoy a, a good chocolate, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it is. Yeah. So, uh, Jean-Nicolas, uh, I want to, uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you uh, for the uh, huge work you you, uh, you have done. It, uh, for me, it's, it's, it's a place. It's, uh, uh, what you presented uh, was today uh, reflects the implicit, uh, impressive amounts of work you, uh, you have done during your Thank you uh, very much. Three years, and uh, and we see in in the both in the manuscript and uh, the presentation the speci uh, that you you have uh, uh, very special interest in implementing things and uh, computer science and the uh, on the special attention to uh, details of uh, implementation and to explain why why you do things that um, I think it's worth to be noticed. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's very and the effort you you, you, have, you have done to to integrate all the mathematical uh, uh, or, or mechanical uh, stuff and to yeah. integrate this before to be able to to implement uh, uh, things and uh, I think it's, it's a very nice work you you have done. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was uh, <laughs> yeah, quite some work. Yeah. And um, uh, I appreciate also the, the importance of, uh, of the validation point. We both yeah. know of, of, of people who are working in medi medical uh, area, and uh, we all know how difficult it is to to validate uh, an approach, a method to, to find the appropriate uh, uh, test and. Uh, that, that was uh, already mentioned by uh, Adam, and, and uh, but uh, yeah. you, you you made a, an impressive uh, work as well. Thank you. Uh, and I, I really uh, like, like it, what, what uh, you have done. But, and this raised a lot of questions, of course, and we already started to discuss uh, about this previously. Yeah. But uh, that's still to remain. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, First of my question is, well, I, I'm not a specialist of uh, measures methods, but I'm quite surprised that right at the middle of, of your uh, PhD work, you stopped to work on, yeah. on this. You decided to stop yeah. uh, to work on measures methods, or you explain uh, us uh, why you give some hints for this. It's, I, I guess it's why, uh, slide 26. Yeah. And uh, but could you elaborate why you 
choose to, to, to change from one method to another instead of yeah. going deeper on the... I was thinking of, of things like uh, mesh adaptation or, or yeah. uh, adapting the weights um, in different parts, integrating ether and heterogeneity and, and stuff like that. For, in, my, in my opinion, it was good things to, uh, to, uh, to follow. And I, I, I'm quite surprised that you, you stopped to work on this and, I mean, and switch for immersive yeah. uh, boundary. That is a, a, a good approach as well. <laughs> it's not a question. Yeah, question. I guess there's two big directions you can take. The, the first one is, as we did, is to uh, uh, try to find a method that is um, almost independent from the mesh itself. And the other one, the other direction uh, you could go is to how do you create a mesh? So uh, in the direction of meshing, complex domain, uh, etc., which is also a very good uh, direction. Uh, for us, uh, I mean, starting with mesh tests, we were already uh, inside the implementation of new methods. Um, uh, Going back to a traditional finite element mesh without respecting the boundaries, which was as close as what we have did, done before with meshless, was for us the, the, the closest or the, uh, the better way to go. As I said, we also quite like the idea of this background mesh. So, of course, we could go in the directions of let's try to improve current exahedral measure software, for example, or uh, try to improve, uh, I mean, any measures so that they are able to generate a uh, good mesh almost automatically. But for us, you, will, you could never go as simple as simply putting a background grid. Um, now, obviously, the, uh, the immersed boundary method, oh, can you see the, the screen? Tickets. Okay, so the, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, this immersed boundary method is not restricted to uh, regular grids, right? We could still reuse um, an advanced measures that generate us uh, exahedral meshes uh, a little bit more uh, closer to the boundaries and use this immersed boundary scheme to slack a little bit the uh, criteria of really following the, the boundaries. So, like I said, we, we could have gone into the improving current automatic mesh methods, or we could go in the direction of if we are to keeping these current meshing methods, how can we improve the rest of the simulation or the, co the co computations? And we decided to follow this lead. So, yeah. But in May, when I mentioned mesh adaptation, I was thinking um, of uh, background mesh adaptation on the choice. Uh, yeah. How to I choose the, the weighting or to adapt on the weighting on, um, on places you, you need or you, you have a uh, um, bigger density of points or something like that because you, you didn't... I, 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 I didn't see this, but I, I, I guess... You're adapting the, the elements? This, this, this in, so. Because you, you mean like snapping the, uh, the nodes? Uh, oh, that was another question. <laughs> ah, okay, sorry. Oh, no, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay. No, I, I was in, really in the meshless method uh, on, on adapting the, the, the density of the, of the particles. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, well, yeah, this one is also, that, that's also another reason why we switch, because, again, we are falling back in, inside the question, of how do we mesh important region. Uh, in this mm -hmm. case, we add more nodes, which is kind of similar to adding more elements around these regions. So that's why it was uh, also, uh, yeah, for us, it's another uh, parameters that we have to set for meshless methods, which, again, uh, kind of decreases our simplicity criterion. But of course, for someone that is not that much interested for simplicity, uh, then 
Mesh has method has a, a lot of good, uh, uh, I mean, I would say of good plants are, they, they are very attractive because you can easily add more particles inside some region of the, uh, the simulated domain to add accuracy in those region. Uh, mm -hmm. They are also very attractive for cutting simulations because you can um, remove the influence of a particle from its neighbors that is uh, across a cut uh, surface or a discontinuity. So when you don't have the simplicity criterion that we have, mesh test method could actually be very good uh, alternative method. Um, and and we, have, uh, we are quite certain of this. But for, for us, for our kind of application, even adding dens uh, a density of particle at some region wasn't that much important when you compare it to the simplicity of, uh, uh, of setting up the simulations. I understand. No, that's, that's interesting. And um, if, if we... Uh, you, you hear something? Yeah. Okay, it's not it's fun. <laughs> Maybe it's my yeah. microphone. I can turn it turn it off. Uh, yeah. What I was saying is that it's as a IBM method. I, I, as I mentioned previously, I like it very much. This this approach and uh, I, I like it the, the way it is a very simple approach. How you manage to create a great improvement the resolution? Yeah, it's better. <coughs> so um, this leads to a, a twofold question. Uh, that is um, about the snapping you previously uh, mentioned. That, in my sense, may help to. Uh, uh, help to, to respect boundaries or to, or to better handle uh, heterogeneities. And the, the, the other fault is um, how much is missing to, to use mixed elements? Like you mentioned tetrahedral, but you have prism on uh, pyramids and things like that. Uh, on the, because if you use snapping, you will lose the, the regularity of the cubic elements. And uh, on maybe it's it's, a it's not as a good uh, good idea because the regularity of the support of the quadrature is something that is very important in in, in this method. And um, but I was just uh, um, wondering um, how, how the, the use of all the uh, kinds of elements or snappings. Uh, would, would be interesting losing simplicity but bringing uh, all, all the other interesting uh, points. Yeah. Okay, I, I've missed some parts of, uh, of your question because uh, oh. we, we have some technical difficulties, but I, I think I, I got most of it. So. Um, now, first for the snapping, it is already something that is explored because sometimes with IBM methods, you will have uh, elements that are very, really badly cut by the surface. So you will have a huge part of the elements lying completely outside the actual domains and a very, very small one inside. So in this case, these might generate numerical problems, especially when you are using uh, iterative solvers, linear solvers, such as uh, conjugate gradient solvers. So in this case, there are different ways to improve this, and one of them is snapping. So snapping will displace one node um, such that the element that is badly cut is actually now completely removed from the simulations, right? We have remeshed a little bit this part of the regions. The thing is, snapping is not, I mean, from, from what we uh, have seen, it's not that simple, right? It displays one node, so, but by doing so, it will also uh, change the shape of the surrounding elements. And, and now dealing with these uh, exceptions, because you always have exceptions that comes up when you start looking for meshing methods. And for us, 
we if we were going to snapping we were going the direction of uh, of meshing right so we kind of wanted to stay away note that it is not it is simply a decision for from our uh, research point it is not incompatible obviously with what we have done we could obviously use uh, any kind of elements the, the grid the background grid is simply very simple for us and if we are able to make it work with this background grid uh, then obviously it will be for us even better if we have a more adapt grid where uh, these boundary elements are snapping or are remesh obviously without adding uh, too much elements because we want to to keep the same uh, speed but yeah it is not incompatible we could uh, go further by adjusting the background mesh or, or getting a background mesh of higher quality we could use tetrahedral elements some uh, there there exists some uh, research team that does this finite cell methods using the triadral mesh for the integration mesh so it is not limited to background grids uh, in our cases it was good because it is close to what you have uh, typically in 3d uh, images so these voxels are actual grid of uh, regular elements and yeah but, uh, that's yeah that's why <laughs> okay. Uh, no, that's, that is actually it's a, it's a, it's a team wise to look uh, for, for snappy. Even if, in my sense, uh, you you may lose uh, some some something because, for example, if if you look at GPU implementation, I think the regularity of the background uh, mesh is is a very important point. <laughs> And that if you start to implementation of IBM Meson. Yeah. So I lost the last part. I heard GPU and regularity of the grid. This is obviously a strong uh, point. Uh, but yeah, I haven't talked at all about to, this. To make my, my question simple, do you, do you think? Um, have a GPU implementation of the uh, immersive uh, remedial? Yeah, we, we never go. We never went as far as this. Now, for us, we are remaining on uh, quite, I mean, relatively small meshes. Now, uh, using GPU, uh, it depends on what you are doing, but uh, sometimes the, the cost of using this GPU on smaller mesh can, uh, the overhead cost can be greater than uh, the one of solving the system directly on the CPU. Uh, now, obviously, if we have uh, such regular grid, uh, which is, as you said, very well adapted for GPUs, uh, it, it could probably be a very good, uh, I mean, research directions. We should explore this. Um, and that's yeah, that's I, I guess, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah we, that would be, probably be a very good uh, direction. We never went there because obviously everything we've done is independent on uh, these kind of uh, optimizations. But the, the, when you think about it, they are well adapted. And, um, so yeah, and it, uh, it is also a good thing that we are keeping the same number of integration points and the same number of, uh, uh, of nodes per elements compared to uh, the finite cell methods or the uh, mesh test methods, which has dynamic number of nodes, which can be difficultly optimized uh, by compiler or by uh, vectorization of the operations. So yeah, in this case, I think uh, the weighted cell, our weighted cell immersed boundary method would be a very, very good candidate for mm -hmm. a GPU acceleration. Yeah. I was thinking as well. question in, in previous discussion, previous to the presentation, we, we mentioned the, the, the fact that uh, topological maps uh, will not, or immersive boundary will, will be very, very uh, compatible with uh, topological maps. But I'm not sure I, I, 
understood how, how you you can uh, mix the two, and uh, for example, how you can handle topological cuts. Yeah. If, if um, you need to, all of you, if you have to, to I, separate the elements of the background mesh, I, I don't really understand at at what level is, uh, the. the the, the topological map could be uh, interesting. So basically, elaborate. yeah, yeah. So cutting, cutting is a, also a big question for us. Uh, we, uh, it, it is something that we are really interesting. I think a lot of people are. It was also one of the motivations for meshless methods because they are well known for uh, topolog topological changes. Now, for IBM, when you think about it, a topolog topological change uh, is actually a new surface uh, that you, uh, so you, you are actually recreating a surface somewhere. The discontinuity will be uh, part of your boundary or your new boundary. So when you are using finite element method, you have to remesh around those new boundaries. Now, for IBM, it is actually the same thing as without cut. We are using this background grid to um, to create this mesh as uh, as simply as possible, right? By simply using this background grid. So a cut is actually handled exactly the same way as the rest of the embed uh, surface. It is simply a new surface uh, uh, inside our simulated object. So this is why it is super interesting, also, um, and. Obviously, there, there are probably different uh, problems to solve with them. But when you think about it, a bad cut or a bad topolo topological change is about the same as a bad surface that you had uh, previously or initially with your, uh, for example, liver. If you have a liver with a very, very small uh, vessels that you want to model or uh, s uh, some very sharp curve uh, uh, around one of its lobes, it is actually difficult to mesh. Uh, and, and it will be actually the same for a cut, right? These are difficult region to mesh, uh, and in this case, it is handled the same way with the immersed boundary methods. That, that's why it's probably also a good candidate for topological changes. Okay, I understand. That's, a, that's interesting. And uh, maybe the last, last question. Yeah. Maybe, uh, I, I think it's very interesting to, to, to see how your work has been taken uh, uh, over by uh, you and your colleagues who look further. Uh, I was thinking on training for deep learning. And, uh, my, uh, and this is a very, very nice work, but I, I was wondering if it's, it's kind of general question. I, I, I the future of deep learning in, in such applications like uh, uh, trying to reduce the number of uh, of uh, results in uh, mechanical explanation using uh, such method like uh, deep learning. Yeah. I mean, deep learning is uh, it's a very hot topic at the moment. Yeah. Uh, it is super interesting because uh, if you can remove all this mechanical solving part of the simulation, which takes a lot of time, and replace it by this cool uh, black box, you know, the, 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 uh, the machine learning box that can give you uh, solutions in milliseconds, it is obviously something uh, that will be highly desirable for our simulations or for our kind of, our kind of applications. And now, uh, also with the emerging of new machine learning techniques and hardware and everything, so it becomes obviously uh, uh, an interesting direction to take. Now, um, in these cases, uh, we I, I haven't really done work or research in the machine learning part, but in this case, uh, there was this um, um, uh, deep learning technique that used a grid for encoding the inputs and the outputs of the uh, network. Um, and in this case, using a grid for, uh, as uh, encoding, uh, 
as an encoding medium is actually uh, interesting because we are also using a grid for our simulations. So we, we just figured, well, well, let's use the same grid for both the simulations and the, uh, the network, the, 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 the uh, l l machine learning network, and um, use them together so we use, we'll use our immersed boundary grids to generate uh, data for uh, the machine learning to learn the different uh, deformations and then reuse the same grids to get the uh, output of the um, of the uh, network. So, yeah, that, that's why we did it. Uh, it is actually very. It, it does give very remarkable results. Uh, the, the rapidity at, at which we get these uh, results is very uh, impressing. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's uh, ongoing research in uh, in the, in my team, and it will probably uh, result in very uh, cool publications. Quite soon, I think. Yeah, yeah totally agree. It's, a very, it's not only a hot topic, but I think it's very promising. It's not just because yeah. it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I think I'm done with question on our boy. Well, I, I hope I will dis we will discuss some yeah. of this afterwards. On yeah, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I want to congratulate you for uh, this nice work, and uh, I will thank you. give the, uh, the floor back to the <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank day. you. Uh, Professor Eli, it's up to you. Do, do you hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes? Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, being appointed to be, uh, a, what is it called, a, a questioner? Examiner. Yeah, well, uh, I'm Ole Jakob Eller from Oslo University Hospital, uh, leading a section there for medical cybernetics and image processing. And I'm the coordinator of the HyperNav project that where, where Jean-Luc Gallard did his PhD through. And uh, congratulations, Jean-Nicolas. Uh, I'm very proud of you. Uh, and uh, your <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it, uh, it is very interesting work, as I see it. Uh, it. It is a very attractive part of the HyperNow project. I think this is uh, the part that kind of lifted it up from, from more kind of the normal things where people do the separate parts uh, of navigation work more traditionally, but now actually uh, you were able to then combine uh, biomechanical modeling with, w within surgical applications in a, in, a, in a more natural way. And because of that, I think these lightweight models um, is very important uh, and uh, that you can cut them and that you can run them close to real time uh, using the AI techniques. So uh, what I want to know, what, because you know, had had this discussion of the different methods uh, while making biomechanical models and uh, finite elements models and uh, uh, the, the fine grid elements and what is the different times that these different steps in the workflow uh, would take? For example, this generation of a model from the segmented uh, model. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question and it is exactly why we actually went to these kind of methods. It's because we don't want uh, this part of the workflow to take a lot of time. So, uh, remember when I did a simulation using um, uh, livers, I will just uh, show you. Um, you know, I modeled uh, these three different pig liver using both uh, an immersed boundary grid and a standard uh, finite element mesh. Now, for these meshes, so for, for the, the orange one here, I, I'm not sure if you can see my screen. Um, put, put it like this. I think it will be better. Can you see yeah. it now? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, 
Uh, in this case, we had to generate all of these points here are using different number of nodes, so they are different models, if you may. They are modeling the same object, but using more uh, nodes or more elements inside of each of them. So mm -hmm. we had to create this biomechanical model for each one of them. Uh, so it is similar to what we will do for an actual operation. Um, and now, obviously, I'm not a professional measure. Uh, and probably there are some mechanical engineers that are super good to do it, or researchers. But for me, for each of these meshes, it took me, uh, I don't know, maybe um, half an hour to make sure I had no elements, uh, bad elements. Uh, it actually took me a lot of time to, to generate these meshes. Whereas for the grid one, uh, it was actually no time at all. It was I was only re uh, refining the number uh, uh, the number of cuts inside a grid, uh, rectangular grid, right? So it was automatic almost. Uh, it it is super fast. So in these cases, the longest time to build the biomechanical model will actually be the segmentation, the times to segment the liver from the medical images. Now, if we are able to do this almost automatically by some advanced methods, uh, then, uh, of course, building this biomechanical model is uh, actually really fast to do, as a, a part that is uh, actually achievable quite fast um, using these kind of methods, of course. So that, that's why it was actually very uh, interesting to see that it actually does quite good results while using, I mean, almost no effort at all to generate the model. So, yeah. Yeah, very, very appealing, actually. Um, when it comes to this, uh, when you validate this using or this this pipeline, this non-rigid registration pipeline, uh, there was challenges with the accuracy, right? And it has been mentioned uh, several times, but. Yeah. Could you mention as uh, it's different sources of errors, um, and you have this uh, heterogeneous uh, city of the liver as one of them, uh, but and then it's the boundary condition because I assume that this heterogeneous modeling of the liver that is kind of would of course be probably a project in itself, but but maybe it's by, by or how, how difficult do you think it, it would be to kind of improve uh, uh, quite a lot by, by, by simple, uh, or do you need to go through a very accurate remodeling to make it any better? So it could be a kind of shortcut by doing several smart steps in order to improve quite a lot. Yeah. From what I've observed, the biggest part of these error are not from the model itself. So the model should not it does not actually have to uh, get improved during the simulation. It can stay, it could probably stay as it is. The largest errors uh, that I found was from this, uh, first, well, from this 3D partial reconstructions. When we looked at this uh, partial uh, point cloud, uh, I have it here somewhere, uh, here. When I actually put them one on top of each other with the intra up CT, which was the uh, our, um, our actual um, solutions or validation solutions, there was maybe like half a centimeters on top of each other. So there was an error just uh, from this a difference here. Uh, we were actually uh, deformings toward an erroneous uh, reconstructions, right? So even if we had a perfect match with this point cloud, we would still be a little bit far from the real solutions because this partial point cloud here still have some errors on its own. Now, this doesn't solve everything, uh, and, and the, probably the big, biggest one that I, I have observed, uh, it's again, it's yeah, these boundary conditions on the back of the liver. So, uh, of course, if we are only using this partial uh, 3D point clouds to drive the deformations, it's like the liver is floating, right, mm -hmm. without anything to stop it. So. 
uh, this will give us uh, things like that where uh, some part here uh, floats around and it doesn't get restricted by uh, um, by other structures around the liver uh, that should be there in the patients so uh, yeah these are two big uh, uh, problems that I, I think are already being researched by different teams. They are a whole, actually, research direction or research branch on, on their own. Um, and, yeah, they are absolutely uh, uh, crucial to our pipelines um, because even if we have the best uh, the, and the more performant biomechanical models, uh, if we don't have a good surface reconstruction or good information from the intra-up, uh, uh, from the surgical uh, room right now, this, from the patients during the surgical room, uh, obviously, the best biomechanical model will not change a thing. So, yeah, these are crucial for, mm -hmm. for our goal. And, uh, uh, yeah, so that's it. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, so in order to make the boundary conditions more closer to the reality and to restrict the motions or, or fix actually part of the liver, where it anatomically is fixed to the to the patient or to the animal, that would help a lot. But but then when it comes to this uh, the point cloud that is that um, because yeah well that that is the data from from our side right yeah. and um, I suppose that not having the intrinsic parameters of the camera make some of that. I mean, it's it's. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That will make the difference. Uh, probably this uh, translation difference between the point cloud and the intraop, uh, the red one we see. It's too bad I don't have them. Uh, I, I, I wanted to to show a picture with them, uh, one on top of each other. But I guess yeah, these these parameters. Uh, even before the, um, the 3D reconstructions, uh, you know, this transformation matrix that gets you uh, both, uh, both the, um, the intra-op and, uh, and the point cloud in the same frame, this transformation is also probably problematic here, at least for the validation. Um, I guess it will not be that that much a problem um, in real life uh, while we are overlaying the the the, the deformable model. Um, but yeah, when we validate against the intra -op CT scan here, it might be a problem. Mm. Now, I, I guess you know, I'm I'm sometimes I'm a little bit uh, hard on the results we got. <laughs> Um, these are obviously very interesting, I, I think, for surgeons to have because even with those results, it is uh, still way, uh, way better than looking at uh, 3D uh, CT scans during an operation that was when the liver had a completely different shape and, uh, and orientations and, uh, and whatnot. So, yeah, I guess these are already good, um, but obviously we could push this uh, even further by improving either the partial reconstruction or added boundary conditions, or improving the model itself with heterogeneity and um, and the, the material, the simulated materials. Yeah. Um, exactly. Thanks. And 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 how do you see a a um, future workflow? That, that that would be adopted by the clinicians. Uh, taking into account kind of all these steps that you know we have been through in, uh, in, the, in the laparoscopic navigation for liver surgery, and then using the biomechanical modeling and uh, surface deformation from that. And, and uh, what else do you think is needed in order to get it to the point where it could be used? Um, that's a good question. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess there's also this validation, um, uh, th this validation scheme uh, where, like, for example, here we use this vessel bifurcations to validate uh, our work. Uh, it is kind of difficult to determine if it is a good way to actually validate the performance of our workflow. So there's, I guess, the first 
things would be to ask surgical uh, surgeons uh, what exactly are they aiming for, for uh, as uh, accuracy, uh, how accurate does this thing needs to be? Uh, because mm -hmm. I guess even if you have the, the perfect uh, uh, perfect deformations uh, on top of the screen, uh, I guess the surgeons will not cut directly uh, li li by, by uh, using only the, the software. You know, it will do other things or it will uh, use its medical knowledge uh, first and then use this as a tool to get it done uh, maybe a little bit faster and so, and so So I guess the first thing would be to ask surgeons how accurate do you need them and then find a way to validate our workflow uh, by, by yeah, using uh, uh, some some good validation criteria, and I would say uh, that 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 goes in the same direction as those set by the surgery, the surgeons themselves. So that would probably also be a good a good thing to do. Yeah. Um. Thanks. Uh, what, in your opinion, what, what is the most important contribution of, of your work to this research area? Uh, so, to the research area, I would say, yeah, this, uh, this uh, weighted cell method, it's, uh, it's actually very surprising. Uh, to be honest, at first we, we were, uh, yeah, we were not maybe... I would say it was not that much clear for us that it will give such uh, good results. Uh, we are still quite uh, surprised by them because the method in itself is not that complicated, but it does great actually. And and it was actually even better when we went to uh, trying this on very complex scenario as this one. Um, so I guess this this is great. Uh, this is a very great uh, step. Uh, in the research directions, um, and uh, yeah, that would be probably the the, the biggest one. Uh, there's also everything that we don't see from this research is the implementation part. So uh, a big part of, of my time uh, during this PhD was to actually implement these uh, these complex methods that you don't find usually in commercial softwares. So I spent a lot of time doing this, and I guess this work would also be useful for research. Mm -hmm. uh, it is actually public now, uh, and it is used by some researcher uh, already. So I guess that would also be a good contribution, and I, I'm really happy uh, for, uh, and proud of it, yeah. You should be, absolutely. And, uh, and what... Uh... <laughs> Is there anything, thinking more retrospectively, uh, you would have done different if you if you should start all over again? Is it something that you um, yeah, could have done uh, different then? I guess this this meshless method uh, has taken me a lot of time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, again, from the implementation point of view, it is uh, it is very difficult to do. You know the. You, Dealing with point clouds in general is difficult. Uh, so when you start uh, w when you start looking in these directions, you have many different methods popping up. Like like Adam said, did you try this method? No, there are so many of them. It it took a lot of time uh, to implement. So I guess I'm not sure I would take the same direction first, uh, starting my PhD. But it does have the advantage that uh, it. It made me learn a lot very fast, so meshless was good for that. Um, but yeah, if I would restart it, maybe I would start with IBM directly. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. I, I don't think I have more uh, questions. I, I, I think it is great work. Uh, I think it is a very important contribution to the field. And, uh, Thank you a lot. Thanks a lot. And yeah, I also hope we will have uh, the occasions to work together again. That's very good. Thank you. So uh, it's now my turn to speak. <laughs> so 
Jean-Nicolas, so I would like first to congratulate you uh, for this uh, impressive uh, work. Um, I'm not at all a specialist of this field, but uh, I enjoyed uh, reading your manuscript. Um, we can uh, understand by reading it uh, that it uh, mix uh, several fields, uh, such as uh, computer fields, um, inverse problems, uh, and so on, biology, of course. Uh, you were able to present uh, all the aspects of the problem and uh, highlight the main difficulty you had to overcome, so congratulations. <laughs> and uh, I have uh, some little questions. Uh, so first, uh, um, regarding the meshless uh, method, uh, you wrote a sentence uh, that uh, seemed um, a little bit strange uh, to me. <laughs> uh, you, you wrote, uh, we were not able to differentiate uh, um, regarding the, the choice of the weight function W. Yeah. Uh, you wrote, we were not able to differentiate the quality of the solutions uh, nor the impact of the, um, on the convergence rate. So why? Because uh, you made other, all the simulation, simulations, so, uh, at least from a um, heuristic point of view, you, you should be able to compare the, the results uh, to, to answer the question, what is to, to your mind the best choice of uh, weight uh, W? Yeah, uh, that also comes with the complexity of meshless. Um, you know, with meshless, one thing that comes to mind is you, you play with one parameters and then and every other parameters are now not uh, not good, so you need to change them. So it was kind of difficult to get these comparisons between uh, the different parameters because we were really never cer absolutely certain that it was not actually another parameters that come and that gives th those results. Uh, now for the weight function, we did not observe that much difference, uh, like from the uh, uh, I would say, from, for example, the, the, the chosen polynomial, and what, what, what did make a difference was the distance of inference that this uh, kernel function would be used on, because typically for, uh, I guess, for um, uh, computational uh, uh, performance, uh, these kernel functions have a, a limit, so they will limit a fixed number of neighbors uh, for each uh, approximation point or integration points. So, uh, yeah, it, it's, this polynomial should match at least the, the distance of this, uh, this neighborhood. Uh, the next thing is also, you know, this kernel function of the, this region of inference uh, with the background cell uh, grid. They are not, I mean, they are not representing the same uh, area actually, so the, the, the integration cell sometimes is smaller than the actual region of inference. So there's also, uh, there's, I mean, most probably an impact from this mismatch. Uh, it is difficult to quantify it. I think it is still uh, an open research or an open question. But yeah, so for us it was difficult to compare these kernels. Most of them were about the same things, but the distance was uh, the, mm. the biggest faster uh, factor. I understand. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I have also a naive question um, about uh, meshless method. Yep. Do you know if it exists in the literature uh, some uh, proof of convergence uh, for such methods? Yeah. Uh, it's always difficult because they, they have some. Uh, obviously, it is. Very popular, uh, very very popular uh, methods, especially uh, in um, uh, mechanical engineering. Uh, some uh, mechanical engineering with fractures, um, uh, and it's usually uh, either it will be like uh, analytic uh, uh, research on Poisson equations with using very regular domains or it will be crack propagations in very, very rigid uh, objects. But for hyperelastic uh, or very deformable object, not so much. Uh, and it's, yeah, probably yes, yes, but it's my, my question crack. was also for uh, very simple models, uh, such as uh, Poisson. Yeah, which, there are uh, some. So, so you, you say that uh, yeah. uh, it has been uh, studied? It has been studied uh, from what I remember. It, converge faster than standard finite element methods. Um, so they usually will. Now, again, it depends on which shape function you will choose. But 
typically, from what I heard, they do converge faster. They are, however, a little bit slower uh, computationally. So they will often require more nodes than your typical uh, finite element. Yeah. Mm. OK, thanks. <laughs> Um, my next next question is a bit uh, imprecise, but um, uh, I would uh, like to ask you if um, uh, you have an idea. It's, maybe it's related to the conclusion part. Uh, do you have an idea uh, of um, what could we do to uh, improve your results? And uh, um, do you think that we could uh, at some kind of a priori, physical or biological a priori, typically by uh, using the information given by markers or uh, sensors or I don't know, uh, something to improve uh, your results. And do, do you have an idea of uh, how to do, to do this? Yes, <laughs> I do, actually. <laughs> uh, you you uh, brought me something, and probably it will also be interesting for you, you Oli Jacob. Um, if you... Let's say you, you, you add this partial reconstruction of the liver as the only uh, thing that will uh, make the organ deform, so it's the only input you have. Then you have the, the solutions I had. But then if you add, let's say, a small penalty on one of the markers inside, just like if you, know, if, if you were able to know this position, only this one. Now, I don't have the results here, so you have to trust me, but the whole region around this point, so this, uh, this additional information you are feeding, kind of converge to the, the good solution. So it is impacting uh, big regions around it. So if you are able to feed the model with internal informations, like uh, an ultrasound, uh, ultrasound uh, probe, then you are actually giving, us, uh, giving the model uh, boundary conditions or more informations that will make it converge to the good solutions. Now, I'm not sure if what I will say is accurate, but to me, uh, we are converging uh, to a solutions that, that is valid, right? That respects the boundaries that we are actually imposing. But it, it might also be valid with different internal configurations or different solutions. So adding s more information uh, inside the organs should actually uh, make a choice between these different solutions and make us converge to the real actual conversion. So I think that would probably be one of the best uh, directions to go to really improve or at least remove the error coming from the missing information part of the simulation. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, maybe a last question um, related to the IBM uh, method. Uh, in general, uh, um, this is uh, Michel Duprez who told me uh, that, uh, we, we had some kind of uh, stabilization term. Uh, do you use the, this? So, so, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, so this is uh, mainly for badly cut cells. So. Um, when you when the embed surface is entering uh, inside the background elements, but on a very very small portions, mm -hmm. then you have numerical problems that start to appear, especially for uh, um, uh, iterative solvers, linear solvers such as the conjugate gradient. Now. There are different methods that try to improve this. There's the Gauss penalty methods. Uh, um, you will probably uh, see um, the cut FM methods that is well known. They do this, they, they kind of add uh, stability terms in those uh, badly cut elements to try to improve the uh, conditioning of the, the, the matrix. There are other others uh, methods. There are uh, diagonal scaling of the scale of the shape functions. Uh, there are, uh, I think, um, uh, some kind of uh, uh, how do they call this? It's uh, virtual materials, not virtual, but they are uh, inserting some kind of materials inside the empty space so that it uh, it kind of smooth out the discontinuity you have. Uh, and next, there are a couple of geometrical methods like snapping that will try to improve the mesh there. Now, for us, <laughs> I, I don't know exactly where I, uh, I got this. I think I read the paper that said most of these methods actually come uh, are about equivalence to a good uh, preconditioner. So I said, oh, 
Okay, let's try a, a standard preconditioner. And I haven't talked about it in the, the, this presentation, but it's actually a, 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 yeah, a kind of a interesting result. A, a, a sim, simple, um, uh, I would say, how does it call it? Jacobi uh, preconditioner, which is super easy to do, so incomplete um, uh, diagonal preconditioner. They are super efficient, and they actually smooth out those difficulties that you have with um, CG solvers and anything. So for us, uh, using simply these kind of preconditioners was enough to damp uh, the, the, the impact of bad cut uh, cell. Uh, now, obviously, we are in a very, um, uh, uh, yeah, we are with highly deformable objects. I know CutFM often works with very rigid objects. That might be why they, are, they, are, they, they, are, they actually need to use them. In our cases, we haven't found uh, yet uh, um, uh, problems uh, with those bandicoot cells. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. And uh, let me congratulate you uh, again. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, the Thank last you. words are for Stefan. So I yes. give you the floor. <laughs> Um, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, the committee members. Adam had to leave because it was getting late. But So thanks for being, in a way, with us today. <laughs> and it's unfortunate we could not meet in Strasbourg, but we'll find another time. And Oli Jacob, I hope we will at least meet again for somehow celebrating the end of uh, the HyperNav project. And I guess we'll be continuing to work and collaborate on similar topics from what I've heard. Fabrice, uh, <laughs> let's talk about uh, cutting and have a shukrut at some point, but soon, because I think it's, it's certainly a very cool topic we want to investigate. And Yannick, well, you're closer to us. And I know we will have some discussion about uh, different types of uh, registration techniques and how this links to what Guillaume is doing, for, for instance. So Jean-Nicolas, a few words about your work, things that have maybe already been said, but it's OK. So I think at least as people have said it and seen it through your presentation and your, your manuscript, I think we have seen the extent of your skills. And uh, again, you talked about deformable solid mechanics um, all the way to, in a way, very applied work in the clinical setup. And to have been in a meeting with hardcore biomechanical people, uh, they were also very impressed how much you understand that part of the work. So it doesn't always show a lot in what you presented, for instance, today, because you don't have time to show everything. But I think it's, uh, it's very nice that you managed to, uh, I would say, capture lots of things on that level as well. The numerical aspects we talked about with the meshless and IBM method, and all the way to, I would say, also um, the implementation of the code and the different things you've presented. And uh, as you said, I mean, you are part of a European project which has a very clear goal and what you are showing like on those slides. Uh, only those who have done that <laughs> understand how much work there is between being able to simulate the deformation of a cylinder and doing this. And uh, it's, so it's a lot of work, and you've done it. I know it was sometimes painful, but um, again, that's, uh, that's awesome. And good thing you mentioned it, because I, I wrote it down. Um, you've also written a lot of code, because you like that <laughs> very much. <laughs> and it's a very nice piece of code. And this is something we are already using in the team that's uh, released as an open source plugin in SOFA. And that will keep evolving. And I really hope that over the next months, where you will still be with us, uh, we can manage to you know, integrate other things in this, uh, including this IBM method, and really try to get to the bottom of it. So, because I think 
just from the discussions today, I see lots of interest in this, and it'd be nice to be able to continue that and share it with other people and, you know, get feedback and, and new things. Uh, and the last, I would say, more personal note <laughs> is, uh, so you, I wrote that you brought your beautiful Canadian accent to the team. <laughs> And, uh, but your kindness also and your passion for bikes and open source code, which is a very mixed uh, topics, but I think uh, it's, it's, it's nice. I mean, not everyone is interested in, I would say, sharing his research and developing code. So I think it's, but it also shows in the fact that you like to help others, and I think everybody in the team will be able to witness this. And you're very professional. I mean, just the way you've prepared today, uh, the amount of time you spent on that, uh, that's awesome. And the YouTube streaming and all of that, it's, uh, <laughs> but I'm, from what I'm hearing, it's, it's working well, so don't worry. And also, you managed to finish all of this, uh, including the fact that you ventured into meshless methods, <laughs> which uh, then turned into IBM. In just over three years, with all the work on the applied side, while having a baby in the middle of all of this. So again, I think that's quite an achievement, and you can be very proud of what you have done, and I certainly am very proud. So again, congrats. Thank you very much. Sure. OK, so thank you. So uh, now I think that we will uh, deliberate. Yeah. So okay. we stay in this room, I think. Um, we'll close the stream. Yeah, exactly. We stay, we close the stream, we cut the microphone.